And welcome here at the Goethe Institute, Max Müller Duan, Bangalore. Thank you all for coming on a Wednesday afternoon. Great to have you here. Today we are here to present Navina Sundaram's life's work, The Fifth Wall. The digital archive, The Fifth Wall, gathers films, reportages, moderations, texts, letters, and photos by the filmmaker and editor Navina Sundaram from over 40 years of her work in German television. In this material, Navina comes across as a journalist who took a stand on internationalism and decolonization, uh, on the questions of class and gender, against racism and discrimination, and on Indian and German politics. An event that we start planning with Vivan Sundaram, Navina's brother, um, uh, is sadly happening without him. We at the Goethe Institute are extremely saddened by his demise. He was one of our close and long-standing partners, and he was very keen on presenting the archive here in Bangalore. It is with his memory and his spirit that we take today's event forward. I would like to quickly uh, introduce uh, the program for today. We are pleased to have with us Merle Krüger. Welcome novelist and film author who, along with Mareike Bernian, has created this archive. Merle will introduce the archive and give us a website walkthrough, followed by a discussion on the idea of present in archiving projects with filmmaker Deepa Damrash. After a tea break, we invite you to join us for a screening of the documentary Portrait of the Patriot by Navina Sundaram followed by a discussion with filmmaker, curator, and author Madhu Sridhuta, and a Q&A with the audience afterwards. So thanks again for joining us today, and I hand over to Merle Kruger now. Thanks for welcoming. Thanks for being here. Um, I would like to start, as you can see, this is a photo of Navina and her brother Vivan, and I would like to read out a statement by uh, the Shergi Sundaram Arts Foundation, who is actually also one of our co-hosts today and of the whole tour. And um, actually, it was written and presented in Delhi by Ashish Raja Daksha. And I will just read it today because I find it a very nice, um, you know, framing for today's presentation. It was, it was less than a year ago that we lost Navina on April 22, whose work we have gathered today to see and hear and whom we shall remember and celebrate this afternoon. What was not known when this event was planned and worked towards was that by the time we got to this occasion we would lose Vivan as well. <coughs> Present company does not need any introduction to Vivan. The biographical details, the major landmarks in contemporary art, that you participated in and mostly initiated, these are well known. It is worth remembering that even as we mourn, mourn Vivan, we remember that his most recent work is currently on display at Charger and is, like the hereafter of all art, accruing new meaning, even a prescient. That the height, heights of Machu Picchu, which may have been the first time that Vivan perhaps hit his true creative stride, is on display at the Kochi Museum's Biennial, and that in a short while his landmark memorial, his own act of ritual remembrance of for another man, will be on display at the Tate Modern. That the book Casaudi Art Center 1976 to 1991, which Vivan oversaw down to its last detail, will be out soon, and along with it a series of events that he helped conceptualize. That the Casauli Art Center itself, which he has again designed down to his last detail, will soon be in place. And that the Shergi Sundaram Arts Foundation, carrying forward both Navina's and Vivan's vision and legacy, has now become a fully fledged arts institution with numerous plans, all conceived by Vivan or in direct consultation with him, over at least the next few years. It includes grants of support to photography, installation art, archival work, organizational work of various kinds, and of course publication work alongside the extraordinary Tulika books that have set the standard for independent publishing in India for close to three decades now. Who's then to say that Vivan and Navina are not with us anymore? Can the archive and the afterlife of the historical present now play a role of memory of mourning 
and of celebration that can truly accommodate the preciousness of the present moment as we are encountering it, as they are being remembered all around us. The archive, and Vivan would have agreed with this line from Derrida that continues the quote, burns with a passion. And the search does not rest. There is a responsibility here as much as a desire to do something that the established apparatus of remembrance simply cannot to return to the most archaic place of absolute commencement. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I introduce myself quickly and then the people who are uh, with me in this archive. My name is Merle Kruger, I'm a novelist and a filmmaker. I live in Berlin and I uh, work closely together with the filmmaker Philip Schaffner uh, on documentary films since 2007 and I've been writing five novels uh, in the past 20 years um, in which I try to combine historical research, so the archive is also very present in that work, personal history and political analysis with elements of crime literature. Um, and as, as a curator of the transnational cultural project Import-Export, cultural transfer between India and Germany in 2005, which I um, curated together with Madhushri Datta, I um, got to know Navina Sundaram and started a long-term collaboration with her. There are persons who are not here today. My colleague Mareike Bernin from my company Film who is an artist and a film scholar herself and who is currently preparing the first show of this archive as an installation, as a kind of walk-in archive, um, to be presented at Hamburg International Documentary Week on April 24th. Then there is Rubaika Jaliwala, freelance editor and translator of literary, art and cultural text and books, as well as a trainer and educational advisor. Rubaika has translated the entire archive, The Fifth Wall, including its films, reportage, commentaries and letters. And then there are Vivan Sundaram and Gita Kapoor, who have been the first people to insist that this archive should be translated and travel back to India and South Asia. Vivan sadly passed away now. And this series of events around the Fifth Wall across India, according to Gita's wish and also to, according to my wish, um, shall be presented in the memory of Iman because he really encouraged us so much like we'll bring this back please have the patience and do all the translation and then we bring it back um, and then there's the person of this project in the center of this project Navina herself uh, known as the artist Vivan Sundaram's younger sister as painter Amrita Shagir's niece as the co-founder of the host organization SSAF but not too many in India might know that Navina, who passed away a year ago, was also a kind of celebrity and an esteemed filmmaker and journalist in Germany. So we let her introduce herself. The scene is so And now, wait. I don't say about this. Das sind auch Bilder von, von Indien, ne? Wie kann man sich das vorstellen? Das ist im Jahre 261 oder 62, glaube ich. So. Studio Neudeli. Ah, und jetzt kommt. Das bin ich. Ja, das bin ich. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren in Deutschland. It is believed that at this solemn moment we take the place of dedication to the service of India and her people no, no. and to the service of India in the service of the Nero. Also, I am a Nero kid, no? Da bin ich in der Vision aufgewachsen in Indien. Das war ganz großartig, diese säkulare Indien. Ah, da bin ich noch bewusst in Sari aufgetreten. Das bewusst auch eingesetzt als Strategie. Wegen der Authentizität. 
Although Navina Sonaram presented herself quite clearly in this little trailer, I still want to give you some background about her and also about the archive which is structured around her films before we start a little guided tour. Navina Sundaram worked as a political television editor, a foreign correspondent and a moderator for the Northern Television Channel, NDR, and for the first public program, ARD. That was the time when we had only uh, actually two or three programs in Germany, so um, very, very many people knew her, as you can imagine. Grown up in the Independent Republic of India, um, Navina Sonoram studied English literature at the University of Delhi and in 1963, still being a student, it was not 61, as she said, it was 63. I think now I know her life better than she knew herself. In 1963, still being a student, she was asked to moderate the broadcast series Asian Miniatures, which you just saw with a fan. Um, produced at the German television studio in New Delhi, which was just newly established. As a result, she was invited to complete a two-year training program as a television journalist at the Northern Television Channel NDR in Hamburg. And there, she continued to work permanently employed for over 30 years, 3-0. As a filmmaker, editor and moderator, she worked for programs called uh, Weltspiegel, which you just saw, World Mirror, Faces of Asia, Gesichter Asiens, Panorama, or Extra 3, which is to be translated 3 Special, among others. Later, she was an interim ARD correspondent and head of the South Asia television studio in New Delhi. During her time at NDR, she produced numerous documentaries, reports, and commentaries on the Global South, with a special focus on decolonization and international politics, which is somehow today's main theme, as well as on Germany with a focus on immigration, asylum politics, and discrimination against foreigners. After leaving NDR in 2004, Navina continued her work as an independent <coughs> director of documentaries and author of numerous texts and lectures. So um, this is actually a premiere, because since last Saturday, it's on. If you type in the minus fifth minus wall, oops, there was a dot, minus wall dot net, and the internet works, you land here. This is the landing page. The online archive, the fifth wall, in German it's called Die fünfte Wand, is thus a web platform, a production archive, and a work biography at the same time. It is made of um, I ARD holdings and Sundaram's private archive. At the center are 67 films and broadcast contributions, of which 56, 56 are subtitled in English now. And arranged around these films are documents, letters, manuscripts, photographs, and correspondence, as well as commentaries. In what, wo what we call the foyer or the landing page, you'll find a collection of material, if you scroll down, the trailer you just saw, photos, quotes, and a letter to her mother from the night of the moon landing on July 21st, 1969, which also explains the name of the archive. That's why I play it for you. You can just go here and play the audio. Hamburg, 21st July, 1969. Dear Mommy, I hope this gets you before you go down to Delhi. Today I'm leaving for four days to do some filming in Heidelberg. I will be back on Thursday. Slowly the shock proceeds. It's extraordinary how rapidly we get used to things. Marvelous built-in mechanism without which I'm sure we'd all be neurotics. Hamburg remains a bit prim, as far as the weather is concerned, but there are a few compensations. Tonight, as the three astronauts land on the moon, millions of television viewers will be watching. 
It's a fantastic thing. So many billions of miles away and actually, for all practical purposes, it's as far as Vietnam, which is across the room, the fifth war. German television surpasses itself, or overdoes it, and broadcasts the night through. I won't be staying up, I can assure you, but I will be watching for a while. I must do some preparatory work for Heidelberg now, so look after yourself. All my love, yours, Navi. At the bottom of the page, you will see uh, a registration button. We skip this regi res registration here, which is basically a control mechanism that Navina Sundaram insisted upon, as she feared racist and right-wing interference. And we also felt it's good to have a somehow protected safe space, um, because it's letters, it's private photographies and all that. And just to let you know, the registration is free. You are registered by email and you get immediate access to the entire archive. And now we're moving directly into the archive. Ah, oh, the login has anyway gone, so I can show you. It's just... Oh, okay. Traffic effects. So you... <laughs> I'm not a robot. Okay, so now we are inside. If I go on to archive, the archive opens. As a constantly changing structure, the roots of this archive reach far into the historical and political ramifications of the 20th century, especially its media and television history, which is of course also contemporary political history. Themes such as international politics in South Asia, the Cold War, gender, class issues and labor, ecology, migration and asylum policy in Germany run through the archive. In addition to this, Navina Sundaram's own experience with the field of public television as a woman and as a migrant, and therefore addressing intersectionality, become apparent. The archive attempts to bring together these different traces, contribution and references as a mo mosaic. I think that becomes very visually clear. Stand by <coughs> Um, at first glance, these materials and their different kinds of language, the private language, the professional language, stand side by side like fragments of me me memory. Seemingly without hierarchy, they form an assemblage that is reassembled each time the archive is called up. The objects are interrupted by black spaces that refer to the gaps and fractions of the archive. Because this archive itself is only an excerpt, it's incomplete, and it can only ever remain fragmentary. Please allow me a very short uh, background note here. The archive project The Fifth Wall is a digital work biography of Navina Sundaram, but at the same time, it is a kind of intervention into existing archival practices. Because the archives of public, public television in Germany are not public at all. Um, it's very hard to enter if you are not a scientist or a journalist. And even then, you must know already in advance exactly what you want. Be lucky that it still exists and invest a lot of money for copying purposes. In spite of all these barriers, or in fact because of them, we decided to intervene into this archival metabolism, you can call it, of television, and extract the n works by Navina Sundaram to make them open to the public. So this project is meant to be a role model, a kind of gate-crashing pioneer for others, and in fact it has already become one. By extracting Navina's work, we did not want to take over the institutional work of public TV. Actually, it's their task, right, to open the archives and make them accessible. But we believe that her work especially offers a very specific perspective that needs to be highlighted and should not disappear. Public television in Germany and in Europe in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, and actually up to now, has been a competitive and largely white male world. Navina Sundaram took a very specific view on this, which was kind of unique in German television at the time, and stemmed from her specific, we call it, situatedness. She herself called it between tree and bark. Um, it's a migrant situated knowledge. It's between India and Germany, between a here and a there, between inside and outside. That's why we also chose this um, subtitle, an insider's outside view. It's from Navina, actually, the idea, or an outsider's inside view. Um, 
A perspective, of course, that she shared also with others, for example, with Roshan Danjiboy, who was also one of the few migrants and persons of color who shaped television and ARD. And certainly there were few at that time, and are many others today, whose names we might not yet know. We are very glad to develop this project, not isolated, but in a context called Archive außer Sicht, to be translated like archives beyond themselves or um, going wild or out of the leash, maybe. Initiated by Arsenal Institute for Film and Video Art in Berlin, and um, in which, to give you just one example, also the project uh, by Deepa Danraj um, was hosted to restore and digitize the works of the Uganda um, Collective, which we'll discuss later today. So I'll give you also the website a little later of that network. Now I would like to give you a short uh, overview of the architecture of this archive because it shows also the curatorial perspective that we chose. Um, if you go to, I mean basically what, what is special I guess, there is no filter function in this archive. It's like a shelf. You have all the archive material in a shelf and you can rearrange it. But you cannot take things out and then nothing is left in the end. So it, because it's, an, it's not endless, you know, it's a, it's a numerous, numerous um, archival material. So what you can do, you can sort it. And you have different ways to sort it. One is um, by archive material itself. So you have the films. Then um, if you would go here directly to um, photo, you <coughs> get directly here films end and you get photo. If you click to photos, for example, this one, this is a filming, um, um, it's a making of photos of a shoot, um, you would find slideshows and different photos behind one um, teaser frame. Then there is text. Uh, there are not so many texts in English. In Germany, it's much more. But um, so if you go to the German site, then you would find, um, see, many more texts because many of the texts were written in Germany for a German uh, audience, but um, we will translate them step by step, you know, they're all written by um, typewriters, so we have to scan them and yeah, it's quite something. But some of the texts have been either written in English or, or be translated already. Then there is letters, this is a very special section to me because it's a, a kind of stack of letters Navina gave us between 1964 and 1971 written to her parents and to her brother in India. So it's, it, it's also telling a story of migration of a very young woman. She was 19 when she came. And it's very interesting itself. It's like a journey. You see her settling in and you know thinking about going back, for example, um, which I find always, again, very interesting. So each of the letters you can see as a slideshow. And then there's the audio which was recorded, uh, where we recorded excerpts of the letters, because they are hard to decipher uh, in parts. So we have a German recording, which I did, and then the English recording, which Rubaika Jaliwala did. Um, and then there's the last um, um, section. This is commentaries, which are interviews which we led with uh, Navina, which we shot with Navina basically in 2004 and 2018. And um, that was very important to us, also with other people. We, um, um, we found it important that Navina does not remain isolated in this archive, um, but uh, we asked, so we asked people who are long-term companions or colleagues of Navina, film professionals, academics, to comment on single films. And uh, some of these comments you will also see today. Um, if you go by themes, then the curatorial aspect becomes maybe more apparent um, uh, because the first idea was that we collected like an old newspaper where you have the sports, cultural sections, right? Um, but then we thought, no, um, that seems so outdated and not appropriate. So we tried to, 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 to look at it from today and reflect Navina's situatedness and her refusal to lo locate herself in only one place. So we try to <coughs> keep it off a Eurocentric angle, not having it like Germany and then Asia yeah. and then rest of the world. Kind of, you know, the angle um, should be more a transnational angle because she herself was, um, um, was, what, was such a multi-perspective person. Um, so the themes are now uh, media migration, international politics, decolonization, culture, human rights, racism, labor relations, gender, global economy, and other. You can also sort by um, program, 
um, like the, if you know, for example, faces of Asia, you can just go there and then you find all the faces of Asia um, films which are there or after a year of production. And then there is a, another place in the archive called the workspace. Um, right now in the English workspace, there's just the launch of the English version, but it's a place which uh, we want to grow. Um, um, in the German uh, part, it, it contains already research papers which have been done on the archive. It was published in 2021 in Germany. Um, related publications, last interviews Navina gave herself. And in the next weeks and months, it will be showing also paths through the archive. We are currently preparing curatorial perspective and educational tools, which gives you, for example, if you are a teacher or if you are uh, a group of people who want to discuss a certain theme or issue, uh, an idea of how you could navigate through the archive. And, um, and this is also what I would like to do now. Um, I would like to take you on a short thematic walk along the axis of political documentaries in this archive. Um, and I will start with a short excerpt, which you have already um, seen in the trailer. Uh, it's a film um, uh, which is called So Long As There Are Tears. It was Navina's first long feature. And I show you the beginning and then I tell you a bit about the film. <coughs> It's just the first two minutes. 14. August 1947, Indien, Bildzeit. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. It is fitting that at this solemn moment we take the pledge of dedication to the service of India and her people and to the still larger cause of humanity. The service of India means the service of the millions who suffer. It means the ending of poverty and ignorance and disease and inequality of opportunity. The ambition of the greatest men of our generation has been to wipe every tear from every eye. That may be beyond us, but so long as there are tears and suffering, so long our work will not be over. 72. Meine Generation kennt weder die Kolonialherrschaft noch den Freiheitskampf Mahatma Gandhis. Ich bin im unabhängigen Indien aufgewachsen, das mir als Mitglied einer privilegierten Klasse alle Möglichkeiten zur Erziehung, zur Berufsausübung und zum Geldverdienen geboten hat. Was selbstverständlich war, für mich ist aber für die große Mehrheit meiner Landsleute unerreichbar. Wie alle Inder bin ich stolz auf die außenpolitischen Erfolge meines Landes, auf den wirtschaftlichen Aufschwung und darauf, dass die Einheit der Nation gewahrt wurde. Das kann mich aber nicht darüber hinwegtäuschen, dass die grundlegenden sozialen Probleme noch so ungelöst sind wie vor 25 Jahren. See, under each film you will find the year and the theme and then a little text. Um, using archival footage, this film analyzes Indian history under the leadership of Jawaharlal Nehru, Lalhat Bahadur Shastri and Indira Gandhi from foreign, domestic and economic policy perspectives. And at the end of the film is the sober realization that only a small percentage of Indian population has benefited from the progress of the last 25 years. And here I would like to show you how these commentaries work because, um, just a second, I go back to the archive. And then I would go to directly to uh, commentaries. And here, um, Lutz Malerwein um, is a senior editor and a correspondent already in 1972 when Navina made this film and um, later he became a close friend. So we asked him to give a short comment on this film from today's point of view, which I would like to show you. It's very short. 
I go to first grade. We did this in Zoom because we did. So it. war sie 1972. Lavina Sundaram, eine junge schöne Frau mit indischem Pass, die für die deutschen Fernsehzuschauer die Entwicklung bilanzierte, die Indien seit seiner Unabhängigkeit nach 25 Jahren genommen hatte. Nadine hatte vorher schon einige Jahre beim Norddeutschen Rundfunk erfolgreich gearbeitet, aber für dieses Jubiläumsprojekt musste sie erhebliche Vorbehalte ihrer deutschen Kollegen überwinden. Denn sie wollte nicht, dass ihr Heimatland wie üblich aus westlicher Sicht dargestellt würde. Unbeirrbar und nachgiebig kämpferisch eben konnte sie ihren dramaturgischen Ansatz durchsetzen. Neue Dreharbeiten allerdings in Indien gab, wurden ihr nicht genehmigt, aus Kostengründen, wie es damals hieß. Auch das irritierte sie nicht wirklich, kannte sie doch eindringliches Archivmaterial aus ihrer früheren Tätigkeit im ad studio D. Um zu demonstrieren, dass ihr Film keine europäisch-postkoloniale Betrachtung war, setzte sie sich im Traditionsgewand der indischen Frauen im Sari vor die Kamera. Schön anzusehen, aber auch provokant. Nadine präsentierte ihr Werk eben in aller Eindeutigkeit. So war sie damals, so ist sie heute noch. Seit Jahren pensioniert, beobachtet Nadine die Entwicklung in Indien aus gesundheitlichen Gründen nur noch von Deutschland aus, unvermindert intensiv bis hin zur Verzweiflung. Sicherlich Manches hat sich dort zum Positiven verändert, aber immer noch liegen 22 Prozent aller Inder unterhalb der Armutsgrenze. Und das sind 300 Millionen Menschen. Ich bin sicher, wenn sich hier die Gelegenheit böte, Nadina würde den Regierenden in Indien abermals den Vorwurf machen, die Armen, die in ihrem Elend stecken geblieben sind, auch heute noch schmählich zu vernachlässigen und ihnen, wie sie in ihrem Film sagte, die Früchte des Fortschritts so lange Zeit vorzuenthalten. Das ist noch mal dabei. Back. Um, Navina Sundaram, who, if you remember the trailer, called herself a Nero child, was very interested in the postcolonial circumstances of the global south. As soon as she gathered a steady seat in the Zeitgeschehen Department, the current affairs, it's actually the newsroom, no? this is the highly prestigious um, place in German media, where, as, as you can get, um, of NDR, she voted for any chance to go south and report from the hotspots of decolonization at the time. But it wasn't easy, as the whole world was distributed between the different public television stations in Germany. And the first ones to get the job were always the male correspondents in the, uh, in the certain region. Nevertheless, in 1976, Navina cleverly used the gap in this pattern when West Sahara did not belong to Spain anymore and not yet to Morocco, and she was sent there. And I would like to show you, it's a, um, I would like to send, uh, show you this film. It's called Hotspot Western Sahara, 1976, and it's um, nine minutes and 48 seconds. Let me just find it. Today I have to do everything myself, so here we are. So nahmen sie den endgültigen Abschied von ihrer ehemaligen Kolonie mit einem patriotischen Lied auf den Lippen. Die spanische Legion räumte ihre letzte Bastion in der Westsahara, Villa Cisneros. Nach fast 50 Jahren Besetzung ist Spaniens militärische Präsenz in dem Wüstenstreifen an der Atlantikküste zu Ende gegangen. Die abrückende Armee wurde jedoch lückenlos von zwei anderen besetzt, der marokkanischen und der marokkanischen. General Salazar hatte die spanische Legion seit zwölf Jahren kommandiert. Seine Mission meinte er sei nun erfüllt. Er füge sich gern der Anweisung aus Madrid, anderen die Verantwortung für die Westsahara zu überlassen. Allerdings, wenn die Legion einmal zu Hause ist, wird der General als Gouverneur zurückkehren, um eine Rufverwaltung bis zum offiziellen Ende der spanischen Herrschaft aufrecht zu erhalten. Es wird aber nur eine nominelle Präsenz sein. Von den 25.000 spanischen Zivilisten, die einst hier lebten, sind nicht mehr als 200 geblieben. 
und die Macht gehört schon längst den Marokkanern. Das Dröhnen der spanischen Kampfflugzeuge, die ihre Ehrenrunden für General Salazar drehten, ersetzte die Musik einer fehlenden Kapelle. Man nahm Abschied ohne Fahren, ohne Verhaare. Eine Kolonie wurde aufgegeben und wie immer war es ein Abgang ohne Ehe. Ausgehandelt eine Einigung zwischen Marokko und Mauritanien, die Algerien nicht akzeptiert. Missachtet den Selbstbestimmungswunsch der Sahara-Einwohner und immer lauter den Lärm eines nahenden Krieges. Ein neuer Krisenherr ist entstanden. In der Lajun wählen die Fahnen Mauritaniens, Marokkos und Spaniens offiziell nebeneinander als Symbol für die vereinbarte freie Verwaltung. Tatsächlich haben jedoch nur die Marokkaner das Sagen hier. Die Sahrawis lernen mit den neuen Herren, die sich ihre Brüder nennen, umzugehen. Allerdings sichern Militärs diesen Integrationsprozess. Kontrollen sind scharf, die Zahl der Soldaten steigt und nachts gibt es gelegentliche Razzien. Derweil geht die Marokkanisierung der Stadt weiter. Spaniens Perseten sind zwar noch im Umlauf, aber der Deram ist gefrachtet. Neben der neu eröffneten Bank gibt es auch eine marokkanische Post. Militärpolizei bewacht den Sitz der marokkanischen Zivilverwaltung, die sich hinter den festungsähnlichen Mauern des einzigen Hotels vor Ort verschanzt hat. Ein Beamtenapparat versucht sich hier aufzubauen und mit Hilfe der Armee für Ruhe in den Städten zu sorgen. Denn die Wiederherstellung selbst einer Scheinnormalität wird dringlicher angesichts der Pulverfass-Situation an der Grenze zu ergehen. In diesem explosiven Spiel um die Sahara und ihre Einwohner hat Marokko eine Trumpfkarte. Den Präsidenten der Jemaa, der Generalversammlung der Sahawis, Kafi Old Jamani. Noch im letzten Oktober hatte er erklärt, Marokko sei der einzige Feind der Westsahara, den es zu bekämpfen gilt. Jetzt, drei Monate später und nach einem längeren Aufenthalt in Rabat, nimmt Kafi eine völlig andere Position ein. Bei jeder Kundgebung wiederholt er. Marokko sei nun der einzige Freund und gelobt sei der Tag, an dem die Sahara mit dem marokkanischen Mutterland vereinigt wurde. Diese Kehrtwendung im politischen Denken haben auch die meisten anderen konservativen Sheikhs gemacht, um sich in ihrer Mehrheit auf die Seite Marokkos zu schlagen. Da ihr Einfluss in dem Stamm, den sie jeweils vorstehen, noch groß ist, werden ihre Stammesmitglieder wohl mehr oder minder freiwillig mitziehen. Es gibt keine zuverlässige Zahl über die Stärke der marokkanischen Streitkräfte in der Sahara. Die Schätzung schwankt von 10.000 bis 12.000 Mann. Der Kommandeur der militärischen Operation im Süden ist Colonel Mili. Bei einer Zwischenlandung in El Ayu sagte er noch vor kurzem, die militärische Situation in der Sahara sei unter Kontrolle. Zwar gebe es weiterhin einige Zwischenfälle, aber dies sei normal, vor allem im Hinblick auf die Aktionen, die der Nachbar im Osten, gemeint war Algerien, unternimmt, um den Frieden in der Region zu stören. Aber er glaube, dass sich die Lage schnell normalisieren wird. Auf die Frage, ob es eine friedliche Lösung zwischen den beteiligten Ländern des Maghrebs geben könne, meinte Mili, mit politischen Fragen habe er nichts zu tun. Und auf dem militärischen Gebiet? Da meinte Mili, gebe es keine Probleme. Er sei auch ziemlich sicher, dass kein vernünftiger Mensch einen Krieg in der Sahara ansetzen werde. Die verantwortlichen Politiker und Diplomaten würden schon eine Lösung finden, die einen Krieg ausschließt, der katastrophal für alle Beteiligten sein werde. Der katastrophale Krieg schien dann in dieser Woche doch noch begonnen zu haben. 80 Kilometer von dieser Garnison entfernt liegt einer der drei bekannten Polisario-Schutzpunkte, Amgara. 
Es war das erklärte Ziel der marokkanischen Armee, diese Hochburgen der Rebellen, wie die Polisarios genannt werden, irgendwann einmal zu umzingeln und anzugreifen. Aber vorerst galt es, sich in den wichtigen Städten zu etablieren und das Vertrauen der Sahrawi zu gewinnen. Die Armee suchte den Kontakt zu den überraschten Nomaden. Ein Armeelehrer unterrichtete in der Schule. Ein Militärarzt nahm sich der Kampen an. Die heilige und strategisch wichtige Stadt Smara füllte sich wieder. Von den geflüchteten 7000 Sahrawis kamen 6000 wieder zurück. Das Leben normalisierte sich nach dem Abzug der Spanier und dem Einzug der Marokkaner. Freute man sich oder tat man nur so? Ein marokkanischer Soldat antwortete, ob die uns mögen, weiß ich nicht. Sie müssen uns einfach mögen, denn wir sind jetzt da. Die Sahabis und ihre Kinder sind zu den Lebensquellen der Wüste zurückgekehrt, zu den Waffenstellen. Ob es schwere Repressalien seitens der marokkanischen Armee gegen die Zivilbevölkerung gegeben hat, konnten wir nicht feststellen. Genauso schwierig ist es, ein Urteil zu fällen, bei wem dieses an Entbehrungen gewöhnte Nomadenvolk politisch am besten aufgehoben wäre. Für Selbstbestimmung ist es zu so schwach und zu so unorganisiert um sich gegen die neuen Machthaber Marokko und Mauritanien zu behaupten. Selbst wenn kaum 80 Kilometer von hier die Polisario zusammen mit Algerien für ihre Unabhängigkeit kämpft. Die marokkanische Armee verteidigt, wie sie sagt, ihr rechtmäßiges Territorium. Denn die letzte Runde, in der die Spanier auf ihre sahara sandorte zugunsten Marokkos und Mauritaniens verzichteten, wurde nicht in der Wüste, sondern auf dem grünen Verhandlungstisch ausgetragen. Die militärische Besetzung kam später. Marokko begründet den Anspruch auf die Westsahara mit historischen, kulturellen und geografischen Bindungen. Denn das Großkönigreich erstreckte sich einst vom Mittelmeer bis Mauritanien. Heute besinnt man sich dieser Bindungen umso mehr, denn in der Zwischenzeit wurde Phosphat in der Wüste entdeckt, in den ertragreichen Minen von Bukra. Rund um die Uhr werden die Anlagen streng gewacht. Der Betrieb steht seit Mitte Dezember letzten Jahres still und niemand vermag zu sagen, wann er wieder aufgenommen wird. Hier findet man den Kern des Konfliktes. Mit Bukra nimmt Marokko eine Monopolstellung im Phosphatmarkt ein und kann, selbst wenn Spanien weiterhin mit 35% beteiligt ist, eventuell die Preise auf dem Weltmarkt diktieren. 96 Kilometer lang erstreckt sich das Förderband wie eine Lage durch die Wüste zum Verladehafen in der Nähe von El Ayun. Ein ideales Ziel für Sabotagetrupps der Polisario. Die aktive Unterstützung der Freiheitskämpfer durch Algerien ist auch nicht nur von edlen Motiven getragen. Dass auch eine Portion Selbstinteresse mit dem Spiel ist, wird klar, wenn man weiß, dass sich Algerien für sein Eisenerzexport den direkten Zugang zum Atlantik sichern möchte. Algerien fürchtet politische Schikanen, wenn die Westsahara bei Marokko bleibt. Until the early 1970s, Navina Sundaram repeatedly thought of going back to India and addressed this in letters to her parents and especially to her brother. She even worked for almost two years in 1966-1967 at the NDR studio in New Delhi and for the Indian television. But the studio was moved to Hong Kong and Indian television of that time could not meet Sundaram, Sundaram's standards as a political journalist at that time. Because one has to know that at that time um, in Germany, I mean, especially the NDR, was a very progressive environment. There was a, a, a lot of, you know, a, a discussion going around, like how to make, make political documentaries and new waves of um, ethics and technical. Uh, and the 60 millimeter equipment was just uh, tried out. So she felt that she she, she would be more in a kind of um, um, inspiring environment there. So she went back to Germany and, um, and from 1970 on she was a permanent editor and this made her the first woman of color in the German newsroom. 
the mecca for all political journalists, as I had mentioned. mentioned. With her decision to stay, she turned her interest besides the international politics increasingly to domestic issues. Migration and asylum policy were among her main focuses in Germany. Mm. On the other hand, she followed these topics with great interest herself, but they were also repeatedly brought to her attention because her own migration identity. So usually it was like, okay, Navina, this is a theme for you. And she would go like, why me? But then on the other hand, she felt like if I don't do it, then maybe no one else would do this issue. So it was a kind of very ambiguous uh, state which she um, was in. And one example I would like to show you is one of the four short reports she made for the political magazine Panorama, which is a magazine which until today exclusively deals with interior politics. And it shows how uh, Sonaram used her own identity to speak to the German audience as how she calls it, the voice of the South. Um, this is a film which is very dear to me personally, and I think you will understand what I, why. <laughs> okay. It's um, 11 minutes and it's called Binational Marriages. At that time it was called Marriage with Foreigners. But now the we have re- Niemand bezweifelt, dass es für die Bundesrepublik ein Problem ist, mit großen Zahlen von Asylanten fertig zu werden, allerdings kein unlösbares. Schwierig wird ausländische Politik, wenn in Zeiten einer Rezession der wirtschaftliche Kuchen ein bisschen kleiner wird und Sündenböcke gesucht werden. Wenn radikale Minderheiten sich auf einmal wieder trauen, aggressiv auf Fremde zu reagieren, dann werden kleine Gruppen von Menschen ohne ihr Zutun in eine Studie von Hass, Ablehnung, und Intoleranz hineingezogen. Karfreitag, eine Wohnung in der Frankfurter Nordweststadt, Ferienstimmung. Eine Familie versucht sich vom Alltag zu erholen. Die falschen Töne erzeugen nicht nur Michael auf seine Trompete und seine Schwester Nadia auf der Geige, die falschen Töne werden von der Außenwelt in diese Familie hineingetragen. Das hört sich dann etwa so an. Ja, bitte. Hier ist einmal das Rennen. Können Sie mir bitte mal sagen, wer er ist? Ja, sagen Sie mir doch mal, wer, wer überhaupt spricht. Na, also hören Sie mal. Ist doch eine Unverschämtheit. Äh, kriegen Sie öfter solche Anrufe? Ja, leider. In letzter Zeit verhäuft. Man kann feststellen, dass dann, wenn äh, in den Medien meinetwegen ein bekannter Politiker, sei es nun ein Innenminister oder auch der Justizminister oder wer auch immer, etwas über Ausländer sagt, dann kommt das bei uns direkt an. Was ähm, für Anrufe sind das, was wir anhalten? Äh, die meisten Anrufe ja, sind Beschimpfungen. Ausländerhuren, Dreckstücke, ihr versaut die deutsche Nation, ihr beschmutzt unser Blut, äh, ihr solltet rausgeschmissen werden, ihr gehört nicht mehr zu uns. Dann gibt es aber auch äh, Anrufe, die sich weniger an uns als Frauen von Ausländern wenden und die ganz deutlich auch Ausländer selbst äh, schimpfen. Anrufer, die auch erklären warum und sagen, ja, wir haben keine Wohnung, daran sind die Ausländer schuld. Und die Versuche von uns, das zu widerlegen, scheitern, man kommt gar nicht zum Antworten. Der, die Anrufer sind in der Regel immer sehr erregt, sehr emotional und äh, bringen die verschiedensten Gründe vor. Also zum Beispiel auch, dass man einen Platz für die Mutter im Altersheim sucht und den nicht findet und daran seien die Ausländer schuld. Es gibt praktisch im Augenblick kein Problem, äh, für das manche Menschen nicht die Ausländer verantwortlich machen. Rosi Almanese, geborene Wolf, weiß, wovon sie redet. 1972 hat sie eine Interessengemeinschaft mit Ausländern verheiratete deutsche Frauen gegründet. Ihr Mann ist Portugiese und arbeitet als Angestellte bei einem großen Industriekonzern in Frankfurt. Anonyme Anrufe und Briefe, Drohungen und Beschimpfungen sind Teil ihres Familienlebens. Denn Rosi Wolf Almanese engagiert sich in der Öffentlichkeit für eine Sache, die zunehmend unbeliebter wird, für die Rechte der Ausländer. 
Jährlich werden ca. 28.000 binationale Ehen in der Bundesrepublik geschlossen. Seit 1945 haben etwa 200.000 deutsche Frauen und Ausländer geheiratet. Sie sind Zielscheibe von Misstrauen und Argwohn. Denn in einem Land, in dem Professoren unwidersprochen Sätze verfassen und veröffentlichen wie allein lebensvolle und intakte deutsche Familien können unser Volk für die Zukunft erhalten, nur eigene Kinder sind die alleinige Grundlage der deutschen und europäischen Zukunft. In einem solchen Land spüren besonders deutsche Frauen, die mit Ausländern verheiratet sind, Ablehnung. Wo sie wollen, Almanacs Reis Familie ist kein Einzelfall. Ursula Karim ist mit einem Iraker verheiratet. Er ist Arzt in einem städtischen Krankenhaus in Frankfurt. Sie arbeitet in einer Buchhandlung und ist ebenfalls in der IAF engagiert. Die ersten Beschimpfungen erlebte sie, als Nachbarn herausfanden, dass sie trotz ihres südländischen Aussehens eine Deutsche ist. Seitdem erfahren sie und ihre Familie den Unmut mancher Deutsche gegen Ausländer in einer sehr direkten, unangenehmen Art und Weise. Bevor die Familie mit ihrem Auto irgendwo hinfährt, prüft Herr Karin, ob auch das Fahrzeug technisch in Ordnung ist. Denn schon zweimal sind die Radmuttern gelöst und die Bremsleitungen angesehen worden. An Zufall glaubt er nicht. Dazu kommen die anonymen Drohbriefe. Ja, der Brief, das ist also mit so Buchstaben, so Abdruckbuchstaben ähm, gemacht. Da steht also drin, wir haben euch jetzt lange genug beobachtet, ihr raubt Deutsch in den Wohnraum, bald geht euch die Luft weg. Und ähm, in diesem Brief sind Fotokopien von verschiedenen Briefen, die an uns adressiert waren, die wir aber nie erhalten haben. Was wir schon vorher festgestellt hatten, aber irgendwie nie beweisen konnten, da wir umgezogen sind und wir dachten, es hat irgendwie einen technischen Fehler in der Post oder so. Und das ist also jetzt der Beweis, dass über Wochen oder Monate sogar schon Briefe unseren Postkasten entwendet worden sind. Mir kommen diese Töne eigentlich sehr bekannt vor. Ich bin an sich ja Nachkriegskind, aber aus Literatur und auch aus Geschichtsunterricht kommen mir diese Begriffe zum Beispiel wie du aus in der Hure und du verunreinst die Rasse und du und deine Bastarde, ihr werdet irgendwann ausgerottet werden. Das hatten wir alles schon mal. Und, ähm, ich glaube, dass es eine sehr kleine Minderheit ist, die so denkt, aber gefährlich daran erscheint mir, dass man wieder wagt, so etwas laut zu sagen. Also ich glaube, dass diese Dinge immer in unserer Bevölkerung waren und auch nicht aufgearbeitet worden sind, aber ich halte es eben für, für sehr gefährlich, dass man auch von Seiten der Politiker praktisch den Teil der Bevölkerung, die so denkt, auch wieder Vorschub leistet, indem man eben die Ausländer zu Sündenböcken macht. Ja, aber auf der anderen Seite, wenn zum Beispiel ein deutscher Mann eine Ausländerin heiratet, das scheint in einer ganz anderen Kategorie zu sein. Das ist nicht so schlimm, wie wenn eine deutsche Frau einen Ausländer heiratet. Ja, natürlich ein deutscher Mann. Mann zu sagen. Denn eine Ausländerin heiratet ist ein toller Kerl. Und ich als deutsche Frau, die einen Ausländer heiratet, ich bin eben eine Hure. Das ist also der Unterschied. Und es ist eben so, dass der Mann immer noch die Frau zu seinem Status hervorhebt. Also es sieht so aus, dass ich als deutsche Frau mich auf ein niedrigeres Niveau begebe, wenn ich einen Ausländer heirate. Das spielt auch keine Rolle, ob der Mann der Ausländer Akademiker ist oder nicht. Und noch ein Beispiel, die Familie Bayo Martins. Er ist ein nigerianischer Dichter, der zusammen mit seiner deutschen Frau in der Nähe von Frankfurt lebt. Bayo Martins hat seine Gefühle in einem Gedicht zusammengefasst. Gesine Bayer Martins arbeitet in einem Büro. 
Sie engagiert sich nicht wie die meisten anderen Frauen in der Öffentlichkeit für Ausländerrechte, ist also nicht exponiert. Von anonymen Briefen und Anrufen bleibt die Familie deswegen verschont. Doch die Umwelt lässt sie selten vergessen, dass sie anders sind. Man ist in einem Fall und anderen nicht, man ist immer der solche Mittelpunkt, wo man hinkommt. Merkt man, dass die Leute an angucken und äh, auch den Merkungen machen. Manchmal ist es so, dass wir nicht vielleicht gerade zusammengehen und dann es ist mir alle geschehen in einem großen Supermarkt, wie ich äh, Wein probierte und mein Mann war zu einem anderen Regal gegangen, um sich dann was anzuschauen. Da kamen dann alle der Angestellten zu der Dame, die mir den Wein machen wollte. Ah, guck mal, der ist ja wirklich. It does affect my family too. Uh, for example, when we go out together, my wife and I, we uh, often end up quarreling because of um, this uh, hostility and my reactions to it, which uh, she sometimes does not agree, and she sometimes feel I should uh, just overlook it. But um, I. Uh, Never do. And as a Chris Pondalovkin went to Dr. Anjola to sein um, point, hast du schon mal einen Neger mit einer Brille gesehen? Und um, dann hat er noch rum erzählt mit Negersau und so. Und dann war ich halt wütend. Und dann bin ich nach der Pause ins Klassenball gegangen, habe meine Sachen zusammengepackt und bin weggegangen. Weil ich, das war mir einfach zu viel. Verletzt nicht das. Ja. Aber äh, manche Kinder nennen einander auch alle möglichen Namen. Also die finden diese Bezeichnung zu viel. Ja, mhm. vor allem die Neger so. Und ich finde es manchmal, manchmal lache ich auch mit eigentlich. Aber da ist einer, der hat, das ist, das ist in der Schule, der hat Pickel im Gesicht und da sage ich zu dem, guck dich doch mal an, du Pickelsprießer und so. Und das glaube ich, verletzt ihn auch. In 1982, when this film is screened, and Navina Sundaram is a mature political journalist and widely known in Germany for her sharp tongue against the raising xenophobia of the early years of Chancellor Helmut Kohl's government who have just won the elections more or less on their campaign against foreigners who are, in brackets, unwilling to return to their home countries. And Sundaram herself becomes a regular victim of racist letters and phone calls, as the ones you have uh, heard in the trailer. So um, I would like to um, close this little walk um, with a commentary and a text. And um, because Navina was convinced that um, the worse it gets, the more you have to take what she calls a stand. And um, that's why I would like to close with this. It's an interview we shot in 2018, and we cut it to pieces so that you have little chunks in the, throughout the archive, according to the themes. I have a mind, and I... Die habe ich immer noch. Ich war sehr engagiert und ich habe keinen Hehl daraus gemacht. Ich habe mich auch immer dagegen verwahrt, zu sagen, äh, ne, die eine Seite andererseits. Ich sage, ich mache einen Film, weil ich den, ich habe einen Standpunkt. Sonst soll jemand anders den Film machen. Und äh, das ist dann ähm, etwas, was für mich sehr wichtig war. Ich will wissen, wenn ich einen Film sehe, wo steht der Mensch? Ne? Na gut, das war unsere ganze Generation auch von, von Journalisten, die so vorgegangen sind in den, ne? mit einem dezidierten, man hatte auch einen dezidierten rechten Standpunkt. Sie weiß nicht, ob du dich an einen Gerhard Löwenthal erinnern kannst. Und dann hatten wir jemanden wie Peter Merseburger auf der anderen Seite. Das ist ein bisschen vorher gewesen als dieser. Debatte, aber das, das waren die beiden ähm, Lager oder sagen mal äh, ein politischer Standpunkt, was, äh, was äh, wichtig war. Dann später hieß es, äh, wir waren zu politisch. Es muss entideologisieren, haben wir das genannt. Was absolut Quatsch ist, weil auch die Entideologisierung ist, ist auch eine 
Ideologie. Das ist wirklich. Und den, was du dann, dann äh, verbreitest mit einer, einer reinen Wiedergabe von dem, was du siehst, das ist Quatsch. Es, also es ist ein, eine sehr verlogene Debatte. Und dann finde ich es einfach besser, wenn man äh, ja, ja, die Haltung zeigt. Und dafür kriegt man dann Schläge oder auch nicht. Und dann muss man dann dazu stehen. Ne? In winter 1983, Navina Sundaram appears less on television. As always, when she is tired of the Hamburg winter, the racist letter and phone calls, and the immense pressure on her to be better than her colleagues, she disappears to India. She is invited as a speaker to a film workshop in Chennai in January 1983. She writes a text called The International News Flow, which I would like to quote one paragraph. It's actually also, I think it's also in the archive. Let's have a look. Um, you see me going through it, so you can also just, if you come home and you feel you want to see more, you can just do it like I do it now. International news for here. So you could open the slideshow and then see the whole text here. Um, just as the group of 77 in brackets, um, representatives of the so-called third world are pressing for a new world economic order. Similarly, demands are being made for a new world communication order. It has been generally recognized for, that for the most part, till now, information was only flowing from, the di from one direction to the other. To be precise, from the west to the east, from the industrial nations to the developing countries and that the content of this information, intentionally or unintentionally, was prejudiced, biased, and in fact, strengthening in neocultural colonialism. There, in Chennai, I guess, she met an Indian filmmaker called Deepa Dhanraj. And 40 years later, they met again in Hamburg. We recorded a yet unpublished part of the archive, a very nice conversation between the two of them. And today, I would like to take the occasion and welcome Deepa with me here. Deepa, hi. We need a mic. Is it here? You took the mic. <laughs> hi, Deepa. I just saw my, oh, my whole thing here. Oh, where am I? Sorry. The, no, about the event of the, actually what I would wanted to do is to give one look to our common uh, network, which okay. is ITV Außer Sich, which was really nice because um, what happened was that um, I think, and I don't know how you feel about it, I think um, when you go on one archive, you always ask yourself, okay, that's me, and then there is Navina, we know each other, I feel there is a relevance, there is a need for representation of the stuff, but then um, I call NDR and they say, no way you get Navina's films, it's very expensive, you can have three, and I said, no, no, I want 70. Mm. And so um, I went back home and thought, oh, well, I, will never, I will never succeed, and that is it interesting for anybody. So mm. um, then I met these people who initiated um, Archiva Außer Sich, and suddenly I felt there is lots of these projects all over the world. And of course we knew each other before, but suddenly there was a kind of uh, network in which we suddenly uh, realized, okay, there is a project in India, there's a project in Indonesia, there's a project in Sudan, there's a project in Nigeria, and um, they are all kind of independent um, initiatives. It's not that we are representing any kind of state archive or um, official archive. So we all decide for a certain uh, reason to deal with a certain amount of films or film material or, and then suddenly we realize that we can form a network and that also strengthens us. That was my, my feeling. So um, actually what I would like to discuss today is um, 
how was the reaction to you publishing the Uganda archive in India and abroad? And maybe also, and you are very welcome to join us also in this discussion, how this archive could gather a relevance in India now as we have translated it. I can also talk a bit about how it uh, was received in Germany, um, which is probably very different. But um, maybe you can, we can start by, by you telling us a bit about the, the, the feedback to the Uganda, because it's also very fresh, right? Yeah. That was my idea, so I hope. Yeah, so um, you mentioned that meeting in 1983, which was really um, uh, the beginning of an incredible friendship with Navina. So um, watching, uh, watching this, watching this material, and also over the years, I think every time she came back to India, um, she was so... So every time she returned to India, I just want to say that the the themes that yeah, we just now not need the sound of the speakers. Yeah. Um, so in a sense, many of these uh, themes that she dealt with in her work, and also her her uh, intense engagement with the political situation in India, mm -hmm. it, it never stopped and. I think a large part of our friendship was also, uh, you know, in those discussions and, and in those, in, I don't know whether I was in one of her native informants as to what was happening in the political landscape here, but definitely mm -hmm. those were the kinds of discussions and um, yeah, so I'm really happy to see this archive and I'm so happy it's been translated and really keen to you know, watch more and Go, in, go into it in detail. As far as the Uganda archive goes, it's a very, it's a much more modest uh, archive in that sense because it was something, uh, the, it was a feminist film collective. We made four films from 1980 to 84. The films, uh, though they were circulated in 16mm widely, they literally disintegrated in the sense the material was not available for screening anymore. And it was only when I should talk about Nicole and Nicole Wolf, who was, um, yeah, who, who's basically um, a lecturer at Goldsmith, and she's also a film researcher. She's a visual studies scholar, and I think when she first came to India looking for documentary, Indian documentary, mm -hmm. and it was on that visit that uh, we connected. It's, um, she met a lot of other documentary filmmakers as well, but I think there was, uh, she was very intrigued by these missing films or disappeared films, if I put it that way. And then the journey began as to how to raise funds and how to restore them, and that's where the archive of Sazish, how do you pronounce it? Archive of Sazish, yes. <laughs> that we became I'm part trans. of that project. Mm -hmm. And um, what was, so the, just to share that the difference between how the restored films were mm -hmm. uh, framed or received uh, internationally and mm -hmm. in India were quite different because I think um, there was one, uh, of course, there was one big meeting. I think you must have been part of that as well in Berlin. In Berlin, yeah. Yeah. And where many archives actually presented their work. And at that time, what um, was interesting is whether there could be conversations with other archives in the Global South, mm -hmm. uh, film archives. And so whether other archives, for example, the work of Sarah Gomez, um, who is a Cuban, and could we then have a conversation between uh, the early sort of uh, feminist movement in India and what Sarah Gomez was trying to do. So for me, internationally, the, the way the films were received were both as um, a historical artifact, not just as a film, but also um, some sort of ideological point in history mm -hmm. as to what was happening in the South with, uh, with um, feminism that was sort of being birthed or defining itself in a different way here. So those conversations were very interesting because then we could also talk about um, the, the most pressing question as to 
what is the relevance of archives once the work is available? And what is the nowness of it? Like, how do we bring it yeah. into the present? I really like that. Uh, yeah. You have this uh, address here. Yeah, right here. Yeah. And I really like the questions you are asking yes. there, actually. Uh, Maybe like, you can read that. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted see to. Here. <coughs> yeah. um, was restoring the films about recreating authentic historical documents to preserve women's access, making of political structures for radical struggles? Or would they renew the screen presence, surpass being documents only, and take part in ongoing and new struggles now? Would the films create new screen presences that would touch contemporary viewers in different ways? And who would be the film's audience? I found that very relevant to all, yeah. the, all the... So I think these questions apply to all the archives, yeah, uh, absolutely. including the fifth wall. Um, but what I, I, I think, our uh, struggle as to, um, okay, now to get to India and then presenting this work in India. And here the issue is being how to really create a screening or distribution strategy, mm. which, um, which in a sense is a little different from how documentary films are normally uh, screened here. Normally in India they would be screened in festivals or mm smaller screenings or curated screenings or part of, um, you know, um, part of, um, I don't know whether, whether it's, uh, you know, they're slotted in certain ways, but this is for cine audiences, I would put it like that, film audiences, yeah. right? And our approach was, can we go back to the original intention and the original impulse, which was really to get the films into a more political space? not necessarily cine audiences, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what we did, uh, the first thing we did, uh, <coughs> in a sense, I have to say that of just some background, that at the original films were, we had four language versions, uh, Telugu, Kannada, uh, Tamil, and then the original language, which was sometimes Hindi, uh, Telugu, or Marathi. And we decided to do this because during the screenings, we were not going to subtitle anything. It would have to be received uh, through voice, very simply, through all the people who were watching. This time round, what we decided to do uh, is just look at Karnataka, one state, and we redubbed all the four films into Kannada. This was, a, and it was done with theater artists. It was a very uh, I must say, a very, very uh, sensitive uh, translation as well. And once we had uh, this material, we decided to first begin with uh, taking it to younger people because we were also curious as to, you know, how, how does it, how do students who were not even born in 1980, obviously, uh, receive this now. So the first set of screenings that we did were in colleges, which we selected a little bit, we selected in the sense of uh, the diversity of the student body, um, the also class diversity, language diversity. And the main thing that we did is we didn't do a typical Q&A, which is the filmmaker speaking to audience. But uh, according to each film, uh, because two films are union films, one film on sort of domestic violence, one is on environmentalism or ecofeminism, if you like. We tried to get uh, members of unions, for example, like either the Paura Karmika Sanitation Workers Union, Domestic Workers Union, uh, survivors of domestic violence. And we created a panel with this group. And what we did was they would respond to the films. So I think for students, this was a very good strategy because uh, the films now, it was hard to think of them in the past, totally in the past, mm -hmm. because the, the um, women who were on the panel immediately pulled material from the film into the present, mm -hmm. very movingly and very organically. What has changed? What has mm -hmm. not changed? Mm -hmm. So much that has not changed, right? This was the approach, and I think this uh, seems to have worked because uh, as of now, I mean, already, we started this in November last year, yeah. very aggressively, very. both here and in Hyderabad, Andhra, Telangana also. 
and already since November to now, uh, the films are with so many different communities, and I keep getting requests for uh, the whole set, and they're being screened. Um, they are being screened again, and to me, that is uh, that is the main thing. Yes. That there seems to be, um, it seems to speak still speak to people, and it's still providing a sort of trigger approach for conversation, different kinds of conversations that can be had. So, yeah. how, how, so, so it, it, it lives without you. We, we yeah, always totally. speak of living archives. No? I mean, if we yeah. communicate, and what is a living archive? A living archive is an archive which grows, which people can get access to easily, which are not just um, also not just academic archives, but which you can go, you, you, you can go to, and do something with the uh, stuff. And so that's also a question I have now. How can we make it a living archive? How, how, uh, how does the, or do the films communicate if you are not with it? Like, for example, like how do people reclaim the films, take them, do something else with them? Um, do you already get the feeling? See, once they have them, I mean, I, <laughs> it's very hard to get a response, right? Mm -hmm. I ask for feedback. I always say, what were the responses? What, you know, can you write? But that's hard to get, mm -hmm. okay? The only thing I can judge it by is that uh, there are requests and that um, they, they have started moving in a different ecosystem and uh, we don't need to be present, which is um, amazing, right? I also get requests, a lot of requests from outside India, people mm -hmm. who have just heard about it or who want to watch. Uh, that's a different kind of thing, but I think in India, at least for now, it, the thing is, I don't know how long it will last. There is the novelty uh, question also, right? Mm -hmm. And then how long will this um, interest stay? But I want to just talk about the website because I think yes. uh, it's, it's called yuganta.film. Yes. And... Uh, you want to open the website? I think uh, there's a lot of text, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in each one of these sections, I think the website for us is a very interesting was a very interesting project because the films were made at a particular time. There is that whole historical embeddedness of that situation, yeah. the circulation, what happened there. But I think like uh, 40 years later, trying to create a website now, you have to mm. go back and revisit uh, not only that intention. But you also have to frame, I think, very critical ideological questions as to the why, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think in the website, the if we have a we have yeah, all these uh, uh, issues. Now, how that? Why is your cursor so fast? Why is Shall I? You just yeah, yeah, yeah. Where... I just want to go. Can you go? Oh, uh, yeah, something is going. Okay, and then now, uh, okay, here, the nowness of Uganda. Mm -hmm. This one? Okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay, 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 yeah, yeah. So if you click on that, and oh, then, uh, yeah. So in each section, you will see that, um, um, I don't know if people have patience to actually go through it, but I think this process was uh, extremely interesting and, and created a very good bracketing of this work, you know, mm -hmm. because if you see the questions uh, that I mean, in red, I don't know if you can read. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's good. good. You can read, yeah. But if you go to the bottom, you can see that there is, uh, there is a research journey and then this section, filter articles by topic. Okay. If you look at that, there are, can I you, go inside? yeah, you can go to any one of these and you will see uh, why don't we start here? Feminist Third Cinema. Can we go first? Yeah. Okay. So you see, you, you can go and then. Okay, I can read more. You can read things. more. You can connect wow. things. Yeah. So I think the, this, this project, this process of actually uh, now trying to contextualize what we had done and. and and uh, frame it in this moment. I think for that the the archive was very useful. It was a very useful 
way to work through all these questions, right? So you create an environment for the films, which you can then put out into the world without mm -hmm. having to protect uh, the films as a kind of because I always feel like um, we are also because of the, these these archives are also vulnerable, right? I mean, do you feel that your films are somehow vulnerable entities in the way that you always feel you have to protect them a little bit, or um, because what I feel is that you not just created um, um, a, a nullness, I mean, something which contemporarily functions for the films, but also a way of how people can frame the, the films and the making of the films, the intention to make the films. I don't know. I mean, you know, how, how can we protect? Mm. I, I mean, in this, this, this digital age, I don't know how we would uh, protect anything, really. It's just, I think, you know, you state your intention, you put it out there and um, yeah, so um, just to go back, yeah. so I think, so the website is really, again, uh, another, if you like, uh, ideological intervention in the now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That, so there is, I mean, for example, we have a historical timeline, you have context, you have, a lot of it is text, so only the films are, we have right. a few photographs, but mm -hmm. not much, we, we were very bad at taking photographs, so we don't have any working stills, <laughs> anything like that. Um, so, but this process, in, in the sense of um, really, what do you do with, with material that is from that time, from that moment? Mm -hmm. So, should I go back? Yeah, I think we can go back to uh, this. So we can just go up. Uh, yeah. So this is the films, and then the. Mm -hmm. Okay, the restoration section Sorry. is also very interesting. If you open that, the restoration journey. Oh, there are. Yeah. So this section is also very interesting because it's not just talking about material restoration. It's also talking about the challenges that rise uh, when you're faced with certain questions as to how much you're going to restore. I mean, and what are you going to do with the degradation of the material? Or what are you going to do with what um, Marcus Roof, who is this extraordinary uh, person who restores films in the arsenal, who yeah. talk about and quotes the traces of time. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I think about the restoration process, if you are interested in reading, is that uh, we have a three-way conversation, Nicole, Marcus and me, and it's really about, it's also about political trust, right? Because here I bring these films to Berlin, I hand it over and then we have to find a way to work together, mm -hmm. and um, and that's a whole question of uh, uh, really. It, it's it is a question of political trust, really, you know, because in the sense like what is the arsenal's role in in preserving this material? How do we negotiate? Um, how they will be held? How they will be accessed? How they will be preserved, all of those questions. Uh, and I have to say that I think it was an extraordinarily mm, harmonious process. It was really excellent. We, this, just to inform you, took 10 years. It was not a short time. This took 10 years, over 10 years, uh, working out all this thing, all these. It's, um, yeah, so this is another section which is interesting, yeah. not just for, there is also a lot of technical stuff for people who are nerdy about that kind of thing because uh, that's also quite interesting actually, right? Um, yeah. But it's of course uh, very true what you say, the, the, because it's also the question is now who credits in the end the archive and Arsenal is very generous on yeah. that because they gave us the network but they never asked for the credits, like they just handed them back to us, it was the same. Please uh, join us if you have questions uh, to this archival practice we are trying to uh, explain or, or uh, also frame. Um, just let us know because you're somehow in the dark. I can't see that. Just, you know, there is. Um, and what I would have as a question, for example, the film we saw just now on the binational marriage uh, in Germany, by Navina, in 1982. Um, how do you think one could use it today 
for example, in India, because I think for me these films have. Um, I mean, in Germany, it's it's the same thing. In Germany, I very well know how to uh, put this archive back into action because uh, Germany needs a kind of decolonization of its own history in a way. So we have been showing it in a series of. Um, cinema shows on migrant perspectives on on Germany during that time, and it works very well with um, with people who also grew up in that time as children of guest workers or who come now to Berlin as migrants. And so with a diverse audience, but um, how could one um, use this archive in uh, India today? Is there a relevance? And that was also something I, I really asked Vivan Sundaram when he said, please bring this to India. I said, why? What did he say? He said, I think there is a, re there is a relevance. And one could, um, not just for the Indian films, I mean, India as a theme, of course, this is also part of Indian history, what she yeah. tries to frame, but, um, but also maybe films because she takes a stand in the film. And I think as a political documentary filmmaker, to, to get back to the theme of today, she really um, addresses in the way she makes films certain questions which I think would be relevant to young filmmakers or journalists mm -hmm. in India as well. I don't know. No, I think it's very relevant. In fact, when I was watching your uh, biracial film, um, I was so struck because, you know, in India now, we have at least four states in this country have created laws um, which uh, really make it very, very difficult for interfaith couples to marry. Yeah. Okay. Right? And uh, if you look at the, it's shocking actually, you know, you look at the tools, you know, the, the, the name calling, I mean, you use the phone, now you use the internet. I mean, the kind of trolling, the kind of abuse, the whole question of uh, purity of blood, or um, in India it would be purity of uh, caste, uh, you know, endogamy, uh, endogamous relationships. And so, I'm, I mean, there is, of course, a very literal, some things, of course, very literally resonate. But I think in India, I, I mean, I can't speak, of course, for all of this, but personally, I think for me, it, it, these are extraordinary historical documents. Mm -hmm. I mean, really extraordinary. I've seen some of the stuff like, um, just because big people may not know here, like there is an extraordinary film on George Fernandez and the Indian Railway Strike, which is just unbelievable archive. We, we can't imagine. I mean, in India, we are so um, what do you, careless and indifferent to um, pre preserving film materials, you know, or, even if you go to films division and you ask for um, really important, you know, national sort of uh, material, it, it's just not there, right? Mm -hmm. So, th so things like that. Her coverage of the Bangladesh War, for example, yeah. is just extraordinary. That she had the access, that she could be there, and of course there is this thing where she could be there because of the resources of German television, yes. right? And the the sort of access you get as a foreign correspondent yeah. that many Indian filmmakers would not be allowed to have. And let's set that aside. But I feel for all these kinds of th things, it, they, they are extraordinary historical documents. They are also, apart from what she's filming, I think the her uh, politics mm -hmm. and, and uh, the questions she raises and are also very interesting over 30 years, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, she she is in Babri Masjid when when it's coming down. I cannot believe the places she was in in every hot spot at every point of Indian history when it was so crucial. How Navina got there, mm. and I'm just talking about the Indian section. Mm. I mean, there's so much other stuff. Of course, um, the emergency. I mean, she has. I know that she had she had footage of um, the JP movement. And she has footage when he's just released from prison. It's an extraordinary yes. shot. Mm. It's with the parliament house in the back. He's coming out on this truck. She has footage of, um, you know, police excesses in Calcutta. I mean, it was so in, in that sense, OK, there is this historical moment in time that she captured. But I think what is heartbreakingly tragic 
for me now to watch this, even Nehru's speech, by the way, is, is just where we are now yeah. at our political point, right? At this very moment, okay? That um, when, when you look at what's happening, right, uh, with the in, with the right wing forces, with the Hindutva forces, with the the social contract, okay, between government and people is so broken. Huh? So to have Nehru actually say that we have to wipe the tears, it's it, for me. It, it, it was like, um, you know. So I feel I feel that um, I think for people who are interested in uh, history, who are interested in in this kind of political work, uh, it's it's absolutely invaluable material. It's fantastic material, actually. And at the whole time, because it's from her perspective, this insider-outsider perspective of a young, I mean, oh, not young, Indian woman living uh, in Germany and what that means and what she brings mm -hmm. to that perspective. So, yeah, I, I'm sorry I can't give you, I, I'm definitely going to think about it as to how to get it out there. I mean, how to create strategies to bring the material or to bring the archive to notice of people. But um, I think once it takes off, it, it's going to be a gold mine. I think a lot, a lot of people are uh, absolutely going to relate to it. I had a question about her letters. Yes. So these let who kept these letters? They were kept in Delhi. No, she brought them back. I think after her mother passed, oh. uh, she brought them back from Delhi, and the letters are. Oh my God. It was just a stack of letters which she once I was visiting her, and she said like, oh, there must be letters somewhere, and she brought them out, and she started reading them to me. That was before we started, and then uh, when when we started the archive, I I I read the letters. And I found them so much more than we try to keep this archive not anecdotal and not like too personal. But these letters are kind of um, they are more than just uh, personal letters. They mm. she tries to describe. Uh, there's one letter I read in Delhi from to her brother Vivan in 1971, <coughs> where she really um, thinks about going back to India and the whole idea of decolonizing oneself. And, uh, and she also describes why she always felt so uneasy in India, because of her class and her position in a, in a very privileged family, and, and that she wants to break this uh, isolation. So, um, and, and this is a very personal letter, but it goes beyond. And that's why we decided together with Navina to publish these letters. It's by now it's seven years we covered with these letters, but they tell a lot about India, but also about Germany. And also about this between, this in betweenness of a very young, not to forget, a very young uh, woman at the time. No, I only mentioned it because I felt, you know, she was her own archivist. Yes, of she course. She was a fantastic was archivist. She kept everything, which is extraordinary. A lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people don't keep uh, material like that. But that's so, I think also yeah. in the family, you know, because they have become archivists of. Amrita Shagir, oh, right. she and Vivan, and mm. then they somehow went on with this um, archiving. Mm. I think memory and archiving practice is, is very much running through this, this mm. family. Maybe. She used to call her Auntie G. <laughs> <laughs> she always thought it's a heavy yeah. heritage also. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if there any questions or things. Yes, there is a question. Can you put it in chat GPT? So that people can ask further questions than they did answers. Sorry? <laughs> Just put it in chat, GPT. Okay. <laughs> mm. If you don't have immediate questions, then I would suggest that we have a tea break mm -hmm. and then show a film. By Navina, a longer film. She made actually like about 10 feature films, mm -hmm. um, which had a length of 40, 45 minutes. I mean, my, one would always have to take in mind, and that's, I, I, I feel so very close to the Uganda archive because that's independent filmmaking. That's also where I come from. Navina chose to be a television journalist and filmmaker. And this is also very apparent, I think, in her work. Um, 
So um, she always said, I'm just the television, you are the filmmaker, right? She said it to you, she said it to me. Um, I'm just the television lady. But in this work for television, she really managed to get a, yeah, a very complex perspective on things, which is not usual in television. And that's something I really would like to emphasize on that. And also, I think, like, I mean, I remember in many conversations with her over the years, she fought for that. Yeah. It was not easy for her to push for certain stories or to push for a, the, a certain perspective on how she'd tell the story. And I remember her frustrations and the way she would fight for and also, I think getting it, it out there. As yeah. a commissioning editor, she mm. opened windows for independent filmmakers from South Asia to show their works in Oh, Germany, yes, absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. That, in that sense, she was very generous, definitely, with documentary filmmakers from South Asia. And uh, on a personal level, I'd like to say that, you know, uh, I shared every rough cut of every film I made with her. Yeah, because she was like so um, sharp, mm -hmm. you know. She was very sharp in, in the sense of um, not only the politics, the structure, context, she would always give you feedback you know, things you have missed or, or not uh, seen or observed. And and one of the f one of our films actually, Kya Hua Shehko, she actually did the German subtitles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and brought it out. And brought it out and, and we worked very closely on that. And um, so there were, I mean, I'm just sharing because it was a, it was a very wonderful friendship. And um, yeah, there is, there is a huge sense of loss. At, at her passing, absolutely, yeah. Yes. And I just wanted to say that you know, when you say a sense of loss, it's also because of what the media has become right, yes. for us. That you seldom see someone like an anchor like her just talking about the world and all the complex issues that are facing us. You know, we're just having to face this. Uh, you know, it's a it's a bubble in which we're you know we're presented with a bubble of escapism on television rather than something and that's really dealing with politics and the real world. And also, I have read uh, very recently um, um, a, a research paper in which somebody researched how many places of the world are present in um, the Western news, I think in Germany. The same thing which for, for which Namina worked, like Tagesschau, or the main news channel. And it's getting less and less and less. It's not that we know of the world. It's not true. It's just not happening anymore that so that Indian uh, filmmakers get access to to show their work in, in German television. It's very rare. And even in the news, the correspondence network, which she referred so much to, um, is shrinking. So, like, um, there are a lot of places which don't appear, in, uh, for example, in German or European news. And I think it's very much true for the US and, and the other way around. So, um, there is a kind of, um, it, although we feel it's so global, it's actually not happening yeah. anywhere else. Yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to ask her. I think, um, I, mean, I don't know if we have time or maybe before the next one, but maybe. What I would find fascinating is what was your curatorial approach, mm -hmm. because that is so crucial. You know, we we have so material, lots of material, but what is the curatorial approach that um, you we know, took? That I, took? I, I tried to to talk a bit about during the yeah. tour. Um, in the, yeah, basically it was like. Um, this mosaic idea, but we, we were very sure from the beginning that we want to have it fragmentary, that we want to have it with gaps and holes, because we felt we don't want to create a completeness, which is not never. And um, we wanted to keep it not a, a bit further away from the only bio biographical. We really wanted to create a crossroad between the media history and the political history and the migration history, because I think that's where Navina operated, really. So um, so we try to create something which is um, um, has an appearance of a, um, how do you say, um, <clears throat> of a cultural project, but then reaches into uh, contemporary history 
as well as media history. So it, it gives a broader, and, and also, of course, to give access which is not too academic. Mm -hmm. um, I would have loved to have more texts like on Navina in that, but then we, de we decided to keep it as it is and then have the workspace for this to grow. Mm -hmm. So um, there will be these thematic walks through the archive appearing in the workspace, which people can just take, it's a bit like your website, maybe not as much now, but growing, um, where we have pedagogical tools to be taken. But it's not there on the first um, level, it's more appearing in this kind of shelf idea. It's a collection. No? Okay. It's, I think from a curatorial perspective, it's really a collection which was given to us by Navina, who was such a great archivist, as you said. So we took it and we tried to arrange it in a way which looks at very close to her point of view. To place ourselves next to her actually, from today, from a contemporary angle, and to look at it. Is that answering your question? Yeah. A bit? yeah? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's hard to answer it short. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned that uh, documentaries tend to get sidelined to an audience. Cine audience, film audience. So, what are those political spaces? Or when you make a documentary, do you have an audience in mind that you know at least this section of people should view it? Is there something like that? And what do you mean by those political spaces that where these movies should be exhibited? Mm, yeah. Um, no, I think what I meant was that um, see there are. Uh, but political spaces is a broad term, okay. And just to clarify, what I meant by cine spaces is that more and more, like I feel like in the last 10, 15 years, Indian documentaries, more and more, um, you know, you have so many, it, it's a wonderful thing. I'm not, uh, you know, saying anything about it. You've got lots of these little film festivals uh, where only documentaries are screened. You have Colleges also uh, like media schools, film uh, film schools, uh, places like that. You have the larger festivals also where they will reserve some section for documentary, and that's where most of Indian documentary now seems to have found uh, a space. And it's a good thing. I'm, I'm glad because we don't have uh, we don't have uh, broadcast opportunities for films, and we definitely don't have theater releases for documentary in India. So I think that's a very good thing. What I was talking about is really more in terms of, say, uh, community groups like women's mm -hmm. groups, uh, people who are uh, definitely um, not um, English speaking, not people who, who need subtitles. I'm talking about showing films, you you know, really taking films in, in a sense to to people who may be politically organized, they may be in a union, they may be in an NGO, they may be in a women's group, they may be, uh, it may be a student's union. I'm talking about spaces like this. This is what I mean about um, those, these kinds of spaces where screenings are a bit differently organized and differently uh, received and the kind of conversations that happen post the screening are also very different. No, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. But there's no judgment on either model. <laughs> I want to make that clear also. Yeah. Ila Sundaram is a, a, a woman, a lady, uh, encountering a unique set of circumstances, and I believe she's an she's an idol of empowerment. And I want to know from both of you how she empowered or 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 is a sense of of, of uh, aspiration or or. Uh, looking up to her and her works uh, has gone about. I mean, for Germany, I can say that she was really a role model even in the times when she appeared, because she was the first person of color, right? So people named their children after her. There are lots of Navinas in Germany who were named after Navina. She has all the stack of uh, papers where people sent her, so we named our daughter Navina. What does it actually mean? Because then that, that, that the Palestinian people, refugees, uh, guest workers, who just loved this person because she was the only one. So, I mean, she was definitely a role model on that level. Um, 
But for me, I can say, I mean, I'm not so much junior, but kind of the next generation. She really was uh, a role model in, in terms of taking a stand. Of taking a stand and really, um, and this is, uh, uh, um, this is something we are losing. I mean, there, you're absolutely right. Because uh, then came this time of de-ideologizing, what she described, where the whole journalism went more and more towards, okay, I, I transport the news to you, but I don't take a stand. And she's definitely from another generation. The ethics of taking a stand and um, making films in which you can see the author behind it. And that really um, I, I empowered me yeah, I, and my whole generation. Going on because I remember I was so uh, you know inspired by Susie Tharu and K. Lalita's uh, book. They're two um, academics who are uh, feminist academics who did this two volumes on called Women Writing in India where they went back to BC and nobody knew all these people or rather very few you know. So when you just uh, and they had examples of their work and uh, a small write up and all that, so it was these two volumes you know of works. So though I'm an artist, it was and it was about uh, literature actually. So I was really inspired by that, and I know like in terms of archives, um, uh, you know, uh, Lakshmi, C. S. Lakshmi, in uh, this writer in Bombay, she had uh, long ago actually. This was in the 80s or 70s. She's formed an archive called Sparrow, which is I think mainly again writers and maybe musicians. But I don't know what has happened to it. Whether they're so. Um, so like doing. Yeah, but do they have a, I mean, this archive is so nicely designed and uh, it's also nice that you've put up uh, your films on this, uh, you know, archive and all that. So I think this kind of uh, material is very interesting uh, because there's, uh, uh, these women are just forgotten, you know, like, uh, for example, some years ago I did a performance work with a friend, Mamta Sagar, and uh, we were actually looking at this early 20th century Kannada writer who was very important at that time, Nanjan Gurthirumalamba. We couldn't find any material on her, you know. <laughs> there's a museum on her, but there's nothing there. And uh, she had a printing press. She ran, like, she had, she had three or four journals. She was a nationalist. She was, like, you know, uh, she was writing detective novels and love, uh, you know, these romantic wow. novels. And uh, uh, she was also, like, <laughs> you know, she was a widow who educated, she was educated at home. So there were so many facets to her. There's hardly any material you can get. So like you, when you see something like this, which is so well organized, it's very interesting because it again, as you said, becomes a model like, you know, and maybe like one, uh, it would, uh, there's some more kind of research. I mean, of course, this uh, Thirumalamba was part of uh, the women writing in India, which is like a kind of encyclopedia of, uh, for, you know, starting with some Buddhist nuns in uh, <laughs> BC and all that and coming down till, um, you know, maybe 20 years ago. But, um, so, but it, it's a little bit, about each person, you know, and a small example of their uh, practice, actually. So there's so much stuff which I think is very interesting. And you know, uh, besides this, the, and the whole political society, uh, uh, you know, society has also become extremely macho, you know. Mm -hmm. It's atrocious. Sometimes you just see like just men, 20 men on a stage. Or like the other, the, some years ago, I remember there's been a lot of these flex posters and you saw like, 50 men with moustaches, you know, <laughs> politicians. So like 100 men with moustaches. It's like a joke, but it's uh, it's very, Absolutely. you just feel completely uh, marginalized. I mean, it is, I think, uh, a very important question that there's also a kind of feminist approach to archives and archival practice, which um, also deals with the questions of care and healing and bringing to, bringing to, to the attention something which was um, deliberately hidden from history. I mean, yeah. Navina, it's not a coincidence that she was this has disappeared in the archives of NDR, while all these white correspondents have their own biographies, books. They are called as experts, like until they die, for sure. Um, but the but the woman, the intersectionality of her um, of her experience has made her also disappear. She became very um, also, people didn't like her when she yeah. got older and more um, a fighter than the beautiful, young, exotic woman. Um, uh, uh, people were really like, okay, uh, what's your point, Navina? They didn't get it. 
they really didn't get it. So she disappeared and somehow we, that was really also, um, if you ask me about the curatorial thing, that was really my mission in this, in this yeah. case, to take it out and put it there and say, no, this is a very important um, person for us to remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're Sorry, absolutely now I'm right. getting better. No, no, you're absolutely right. I think that's very, very important, this thing of uh, recovering histories or making histories visible that have been not just invisible, deliberately erased, yeah. you know. But I want to just bring, throw something else into the mix that, I mean, in India, you know, I think I'm try currently trying to work on one archive. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the whole question of resources. You know, it is just so difficult, uh, right? The um, I think what uh, the gift that Arsenal gave our films is just uh, incredible, right? But if you try here now to collect material, and the archive uh, Pushpa is talking about Sparrow is a physical archive. It's not a digital archive. It's like uh, they actually have a space. a space, and they have collected texts and pictures and all that. But uh, really, you know, where does one, firstly, there is this historical sensibility that one needs, right? That it's important. Secondly, where, who would you approach just for funding to, um, to curate, to collect, to catalog, to mount it somewhere? And not only that, to keep it somewhere, either in an institution or someplace where it will be accessible, then there are ethical questions as to access. Um, all that kind of thing. So I think anybody in India who undertakes uh, as an individual uh, researcher, not as an academic or part of an institution, it's a very yeah, tough, perfect. tough thing to do. Really tough thing to do. It's not easy. So I mean, we need many mm -hmm. more of these, but uh, I have a lot of compassion mm -hmm. for that as an act of doing. Yeah. 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 Thank you for this. Showcase of the art. It's extremely commendable. Uh, what I'd like to ask is saying that if Deepa is positioning Yogananda as this form of, and actually to both, to both the archives, saying that if the question of political belonging and political trust is kind of embedded within the archive, I want to ask a counter question saying that does the archive hold a space for political cynicism? Or is that or do you want to kind of, uh, is that in the gaps, especially in Navina's archive, of political loss and of political cynicism? I don't know. I think it's there in, in many of her own works and commentaries. Um, political cynicism, do you mean from the person who's curating the archive or the subject of the archive? Oh. I mean, I don't think that I have any uh, cynical approach to the archive. No, in, in the sense that, uh, I mean, it documents a political life, and there might be points within that life that might be very cynical as well, or you kind of portray the politics of that time as cynical. So is that also documented in the archive? I think there are moments where uh, cynical is not the right word, but there are moments of um, sarcasm in the in running through the archive there are moments of i mean what deepa just mentioned there are moments when navina says in the archive in a comment in 92 in germany there was a wave of xenophobia and i fled this to india and where i landed was here in the um, the destruction of the babri mosque so it was so it is it is yeah. heartbreaking seeing her talking about this um, this yeah. is if, if this answers your question this is really a very um, uh, touching moment in this I mean, uh, just, just to say, I think the, uh, there can be, uh, even if there is, I wouldn't say cynicism, even if there is political disappointment or frustration with the times, or if you feel you are going against the grain, or you're going up against something that's um, unyielding, or, or that, depressing, whatever it is. I think the way to frame it would be like that. I, I don't think, if, if one takes up an archive, especially on an individual, uh, a lot of it 
that impulse is from love and respect. Uh, you know, and, and to really, uh, the archive is to provide a vehicle of that expression, correct? Right? Uh, I think so. But this, that's not to say that you don't map out whatever political context is happening uh, truthfully. Yeah. So it's completely opposite of cynicism, and, but I would take it from there. I would say it's a call for action, so it's completely positive and opposite of cynicism that when you uh, compile a few reasons why action should arise, this, this kind of work comes up. So it's uh, two negatives make one positive kind of a silly logic, but it's called for action and not for cynicism. But I am coming from a moment of cynicism at this moment, why India doesn't have this kind of archives? Or, or why any, anywhere? I mean, pocket India. I mean, Germany also had, should have had many other archives. It's another matter that Germans love to document. And that is what has been their nemesis, that they document so much of what they have done yes. that we all know what they have done. Yes. But many other nations, many other countries have done much worse, and we don't know about it because we don't document. But all is not strategical, it's also a relationship with our material that we produce. We like to have archives so that we can have material when we want to do our own production. How much of our production we are ready to put into the public domain for a free access? There will be two logic. Uh, one is that, oh, I put my lifetime for this, you cannot just open my archive and copy it. You cannot do it. Another logic is it may go into the wrong hand. I hear it all my life, I'm sure you also hear it, that free access, we are very suspicious about free access. We are very suspicious about digital space. In our own world, in our own belief. And let's think about it, why archive should come? Only because there is lack of money? Isn't it there is a lack of attitude, lack of education about what happened to resources, what happened to access, technology of access, this is self-criticism. It's not a criticism to you or Pushmamala, it's to myself also. That I mean, we all are archives. We are old enough now, we have worked for our whole life. So, like Navina, we also have produced enough material. Okay, are we ready to give up free access? Give up? Okay. Uh, anybody can use it. It can be RSS people, it can be um, uh, precursors, brats of this generation who will do something we will not agree with. Are we in that position? If we are not, if we want guarded, protected kind of an archive, then it can be only the state archive. So it's not only the resources, the relationship with archive needs to be thought through many other uh, things. That's my cynicism of the moment. We should go for tea. Well, uh, I have a lot to say on that, but we can talk at tea time. Yes. <laughs> with you about the film and also if there is more comments on the archive. Madhushri Datta is a cultural producer, filmmaker. She has been the artistic director of Majlis between 1990 and 2016. She was also artistic director of um, an institution in Germany called Academy, Academy of the Arts, Arts of the World. The world. <laughs> I always have to struggle. And she's currently preparing her uh, next feature documentary. So, um, Madhu, you said something really moving in this. I, I remember when we showed your comment in Berlin, there were people from Palestine there who also brought an archive from Lebanon, no, from Lebanon actually, who also had brought an archive to Berlin. And, um, and they were close to tears when they saw this uh, comment of yours because somehow you addressed something which reaches into the present but also reaches far beyond India. And maybe you, as a first uh, question, not question, you could explain a bit more about what, what you what you were trying to to say with this comment. Yeah, um, well, it it could reach. I mean, I would be uh, happy, but it also a bit surprised that if you if it could transcend the Indian experience, but it definitely comes from Indian experience. Our relationship with violence. Uh, uh, I mean, it. Uh, my, uh, I mean, we are post 
Independence Day uh, people, right? So this whole controversy about um, whether Bose's uh, school of um, uh, independence through uh, violence or through militarism or Gandhi's through uh, non-violence, we, we, we came after that. It was not mm -hmm. our part. So our first experience in this was Nakshal movement, actually. Even that time, our generation was quite young, but um, that was Maoist uh, movement. Uh, which was very short period actually it got fizzled out because of fractionalism and then but in our case it came through identity politics it came mm. through uh, communal rights where ordinary people got violent mm. I mean there has been state support to majoritarianism but what happened is that ordinary people uh, turned against ordinary people in the, temp, the, the time of uh, identity politics. So I would say I'm definitely, and I hope many people of my generation, we, uh, though we believe in certain kind of radical politics, we have a um, complete distrust mm. for uh, violent uh, processes because of this, because violence in our social life is so related to ordinary people. It's not militarism, it's militarism. I mean, what, Actually, certain major, uh, majoritarian um, groups, which is in power all over India at this moment, are doing on the street is a street militarism. Mm. It is an ordinary people. It's a public militarism. It's not militarism uh, like an institution. Not an army. Yeah. Not an army. Mm. So when I make this comment about Bush's trust in militarism or military violence, but I'm coming from this where militarism has filtered down to our public life, where my brother, uh, my best friend, or my neighbor can be one of those. Okay, um, ideological militarism. Uh, so is, if it touches Lebanon or Palestine, it's great. I mean, I don't know the situation in those countries, but, um, but when I make this comment, <coughs> it's definitely not about war, war front whether China has taken a few uh, villages uh, out of India's uh, territory or not, I'm least interested in that. But it is, I'm interested in what people who call themselves Indian, who call themselves believer in Indian nationalism, uh, what they are doing to India uh, and India's populace. So I'm, I'm talking from that context. Yeah. I mean, to... to if there is not a direct question to, to answer you from the German point of view, uh, I was always struck because uh, when I came for the first time to India in 1996 or something, 95, uh, people would always tell me about both and I had of course no idea, I knew nothing. Um, and uh, then I started to research and I, 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 I counted of course this, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of and I wondered how Bose could be so ignorant of what was happening actually in fascist Germany, which I mean, I belong to the generation who really grew up with this whole thing of that you're my brother, my, you know, the, this thing of happened actually. So um, it was also visible everywhere. It could not be ignored. Also, I'm sure not by Bose. So I felt like how could that project happened when he himself was also a victim of this because Hitler said, yeah, well, maybe in 150 years, but not now. So I, I, I really yeah. found it very, um, uh, I felt very uneasy about the whole uh, chapter. Uh, you know, there are two things here. One is that it's so macho, so male, the whole uh, mm -hmm. Bose's uh, discourse and uh, uh, position. Uh, it's, uh, though there are great people like Captain Lakshmi, we know of them, we have met them. Um, she became a major figure in Communist Party later. That's a different story. It's not that he, Bose did not take uh, women, but it's the whole discourse is, was very male and male nationalism. Now, interestingly, nationalism in 1940 was something else for a um, colonized country. And nationalism yes, in 23 is terrible. It's the, it's the most uh, potent killer of uh, the country at the moment is ultranationalism. Is that, that, I mean, that was worse than COVID. That's the greatest pandemic that we are today facing is nationalism. So a nationalism of 
post 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 colonized uh, con country where nationalism is used for a kind of toxic patriotism mm -hmm. uh, then you look at nationalism and 1942 bose is looking at nationalism but what i'm trying to say is that the seed was there so have we made a mistake on uh, imagining post colonial um, nationalism. And, uh, nationalism that nationalism there is a problem in that in india in a country like india there can never be one nationalism because there are many nations to impose that that map on india that time it was india bangladesh pakistan uh, half of the world actually uh, under one nation this dream that was also come this dream that that everybody is that is not most is and i mean we need to rethink that 23 or to, uh, 2014 did not arrive suddenly no where was the seed of 2014 in our uh, independence and where all these icons all these different point of view i don't know i'm going somewhere else because you know it's such a disturbed time that you ask uh, any indian anything they will come back to modi unfortunately it has become a curse in our life that we don't discuss anything else other than what bjp is doing to the country i'm sorry about it we are talking about bush now the thing is that this bush it's also single issue politics is a problem of single issue politics and this has plagued many other movement i'll tell you something completely different i have been part of the early feminist movement i'm saying feminist and not women's movement because women's movement is much older than feminist movement of the 80s very young person at the time just out of college or in college actually and for very soon we realized it but initially it was very single issue politics it would not look at class it will not look at caste it will not look at uh, various other um, citizenship issues and it will say gender has its own autonomy and it was a very i i said it, it was a very it was the weakest time of women's movement i mean of course later on feminists only talked about kashmir more than anybody else did or talked about caste than uh, before anybody else started doing the by sitting here which is uh, an example of that to so same with nationalism the single issue politics of nationalism that that nationalism is related to british rule is nothing to do with india what we called india or british called india the complex um, relationship of that what mizoram had to do with the um, whether um, india got independence or not and after all um, the uh, what happened in mizoram right this ina entered to mizoram why mizoram should pay the price the 2 lakhs people that both talked about bengalis would not be those people right both is and my kin it will be the mizoram people mm. or the punjabis who have become pows mm. from british to um, come to germany yeah. so those yeah. people from the borderland will pay the, be the 2 lakhs who will bring uh, independence for bengalis mm. in the mainland so there is always a mainland peripheral politics which we ignored for the longest time and that is the price we are paying now anyone what do you want to disagree <laughs> questions comments no i just want to say that the the whole alternative <coughs> that the, the alternative is this was continuous and what is fascinating now is how bose is being recast yeah, to fit that. into this narrative okay. and part of the recasting is also about erasing gandhi okay. there is there is this is also happening so you know you can have different um, what do you call it different imaginings of violence non violence you know to fit the current uh, political uh, needs that are required right so what um, so i i had forwarded you to that letter right of uh, hmm. bosses uh, yeah, i have to comment to him yeah granddaughter um grandniece grandniece uh, so it's intriguing you know the thing is that we the other thing I mean, I agree with Madhu. I'm not referring to anything you said, but I'm just talking about generally in India the need, the need to pull out from the independence movement, okay, to create a set of uh, leaders or uh, that aspirational thing. You know? So either you're erasing Gandhi, you're erasing Nehru, you're whoever you're erasing, but this new narrative that's being built, 
So you have to now re-narrativize Patel, you have to re-narrativize Bose, you have to... Um, so it's just a comment. It's not... Uh, so it's interesting that he has returned. Yes, no. That's but you're talking about this letter, I, I want to explain that letter to... Um, the, so everybody has not read it. It's a letter, open letter, that uh, Bose's grandniece, who is actually um, a scholar in the US, whose brother is a Trinomul Congress TMC uh, MP, uh, quite right-wing. Uh, I mean, centrist right-wing, as TMC is, all of you know. Um, she writes an open letter apologizing uh, to the Jewish victim of uh, 1942 that both, uh, I mean, of, of the, um, 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 what do you call it? Uh, the Jewish uh, of the Jew Germany Yeah, onslaught, yeah. yeah. Uh, that uh, Bose uh, was there and she, he was in Germany. It is not possible that he didn't know what was uh, happening to the Jewish people in Germany at that time, but he kept quiet about it. So she is apologizing. It's very interesting. She apologizes about it. Uh, Pushpa, it is, um, you can check it on Google, uh, where published it. Okay. Uh, so uh, very interesting it comes now. When this whole world is now going round and round over anti-Semitism, Semitism, Palestine, Israel, Palestinians' right of autonomy, over all these things. And I would not take this letter completely independent or not part of this uh, world story. I mean, uh, I would say that this is definitely a stand um, for Israel uh, at this moment. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's very timely that it comes now. Uh, that's my reading of that no, letter. I'm huh. referring to the letter. That, that is a different story mm. entirely. I'm talking about now the way both. No, 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 of course. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you know, that's very interesting. Yeah. But many, uh, many people from that time, and uh, what, is, what is that pattern? Yeah, uh, How but does it fit in this, uh, because as an image, yeah. it refers very much to a kind of militancy, militancy yeah. yeah, which I but think comes militant, very but militant politics never really take, took to him. There are many militant politics, nationalist militant, say Assam, uh, Asu, or uh, Bose was never their idol. But very interesting that wherever the uh, uh, what should we say arm struggle happened in India, nobody really iconized Bose that way. But I want to make a blasphemous statement. I am dying to make it for, a, for actually now many years, and I'm um, shy away now. Now I think I'm old enough, and I should say it today here because it's a small audience comparatively. Being recorded. That's, that's why I'm making the statement. <laughs> uh, no, no, keep it. <laughs> but keep, uh, release it after I go. Uh, is that um, uh, when I want to? Uh, so the nationalism. Post-colonial nationalism, okay. I mean, we lived up it till this point and suddenly it's haunting us. Our nationalism is haunting, mm. their nationalism is haunting our nationalism, basically. I went to Bangladesh recently and I came back feeling, this is the blasphemous statement, if Ghatak was alive, Ghatak would have also become ultra-nationalist today. Those partition stories are not Bangladesh's story, nor is it Pakistani story. It is Hindu Bengali middle class story. It's a big thing and it's very nationalist. And standing in Bangladesh, I was almost apologetic about those great Ghatak films. I know what I'm saying and uh, I know, I mean, it's blasphemous. But uh, so all those narratives that we only iconized, we followed, we, we learned from, we need to go back to that also. I mean, it's not that uh, right wing ha uh, has grown up somewhere else in somebody else's house. You know, it's all the uh, common house that we have grown up. So there must have been some seeds. This, um, yeah, think about those films. Think about all those, all those partition stories. I mean, uh, that is why we also bring back Mantu again and again because Mantu is the only person who could really travel, but uh, about Ghatak, because Ghatak talks talk so much about Padda and that, that, uh, this thing. This is my Bengali angst also, you know, boast <laughs> to Ghatak and all this. So, uh, uh, my basic thing is that we need to rethink nation. 
and we think that as post colonial people we have a liberty to think about nation no we don't now lo long time has gone many decades have passed and it's not a small country in africa it's a one sixth of world's population we have lots of money also so we cannot use that excuse anymore we need to think through our nationalism because it has hit too many other nations not other countries other nations within indian map and we need to think about that before we again in in, in an european institution like this take a post colonial stand and talk big about our in what we are entitled for we need to think about uh, our own articulation about nation i talk too much so <coughs> You called me to talk, so I talked. Okay, that's okay. Any objections, comments? Yeah. I'm just going on another track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all these uh, images that have been used in the documentary are they authentic in the sense, like, okay, you see submarines, you see boats, you see various kinds of things. Are they actually historical, yeah. or are they just some images uh, put in there I think, I of, think, uh, of, of that period? I think most of them are really um, uh, authentic. I, th I think Navina was a very uh, earnest uh, person in these things. The thing is, at that time, they had access through the European networks okay. to all this archive material, which had been, I think most of it had been ending up in Britain. Uh, and uh, so today, and this is really interesting to relink it to the archive now, um, we got the films from NDR with all the archive material, so it's like all listed in some list, like this is from this, this is from this, both uh, entering the train or on. So um, I had to re-clear the rights for all this material because it's not anymore television, it's now an online archive. So. Uh, at that time, it was a kind of, they had an exchange treaty so that she could just take it. We had to clear all the rights once more. And now, this material, and this is really something uh, to be thought of, belongs to British Pate, which is an international uh, corporation. Multinational, multinational. multinational corporation. So, um, <clears throat> they sell this. So, to whom it does belong? Certainly not to British Party, and certainly they should not make money out of it. I mean, we had to do a lot of blackmailing to get the price down by a, to a tenth of what they originally, because we said we we really said we make this public. I don't think it's all right. It's it's it's, it's a shame. But <coughs> this uh, archival, this archival material, uh, historical material, especially. You know, uh, you may know about it, 1942 quit India. What happened that uh, uh, in Bombay, the British mayor was actually um, arresting all the um, cinematographers and photographers and destroying their material. Only some American, uh, I mean, USA uh, uh, photographer, they, by using their um, immunity, diplomatic immunity, could save their uh, prints. And so some Indian and other Asian um, um, cinematographer also gave their cans to them that use your immunity <laughs> and keep our cans. And these uh, American uh, um, uh, artists, I mean documentarists, they took those cans to America. So actually when independence of India happened and they made film division out of uh, India Film Ballad, uh, which was the British concern, there was no, there was no nothing to um, show as quit India. Now we need, I mean, it, they had to buy it much later things, you know, pretty heavy price from America. There was not a single crew to shoot this, um, uh, um, uh, 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 Nehru's, uh, uh, this wow. famous, um, uh, just with uh, destiny, um, uh, this thing. This was also bought from foreign correspondents. Oh. Because the whole infrastructure, British before leaving, the whole infrastructure was killed and no quit India, all independence of India's struggle, no footage was available. So whatever footage we see now was bought back by film television much later, in very heavy price. Yeah. And I mean, I know that she also took very much effort to retrace images, like from German veterans. 
she uh, bought photos and we called the sons of these veterans or grandsons or daughters of these veterans and asked for permission. They said, yes, yes, of course you can use them. So she really took, uh, took an effort to get this authentic material. As much as she called these people together who are having beer. Yes. <laughs> for me it's very interesting because some of them seem to be very Nazi kind of officers. This one guy said we drilled them and you know to become like us. Oh, superiority, superiority complex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like like and we were the best. And then there are others who I feel they joined the Indian Legion because they felt they can get a little bit out of this whole thing. Very cool. See? It's very for me it's very interesting to read the characters who are in there from from the German perspective. Actually, there are many conspiracy theory. I don't know that anybody has um, read this novel. It was not very popular novel. Ruchi Joshi wrote a novel some 20 years back called The Last Jet Plane Loves. And here, they, I say, it's, you know, Ruchi Joshi, you know, the, the, it's a little bit of um, science fiction, a little bit of um, crime story. And there he is talking about that Japanese have killed most. That's his conspiracy theory. And it's Why? very. Oh, that, 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 you know, to read the novel, I'm not going to tell you. So, yeah, I'm just. But it's an interesting novel. I don't know if it's still available because it did not do well. So, but you can have a look. I think it's a long evening. I really would like to thank you for your patience to be with us all the afternoon and for the possibility that we could, you know, give a bit of insight into our work here today. And please, please do spread the word of this um, this archive, these two archives actually, which we and many more uh, independent archives. And uh, if you feel like um, getting back to me, uh, please contact Max Müller, Bavan, or even through Deepa. Um, I'm always available for questions afterwards. Thank you very much, and thank you, Deepa, and thank you, Max.